if you missed last week, we started a new series called The Self and the Shadow. Um, and we kind of explored in Genesis 3 at the temptation narrative how there's like this part of the story where things kind of like get broken, right? And how when Adam and Eve rebelled, all sorts of things kind of played out of that moment. Um, we saw that when they did this, they welcomed brokenness, brokenness into the world. And this like equation created that brokenness then exposed us, right? You guys remember that, how we said brokenness exposes us. And it opened their eyes to things that they did not see before and be, became ashamed of those things they didn't see. Um, after we talked about that, we said how like their gut reaction wasn't to like go tell God they messed up and ask for help or anything like that. But their gut reaction was to hide. It was to cover themselves up and we cover our own brokenness too, we said. And then we said how it's actually like our own shame and fear of that brokenness that creates this thing called the shadow or the false self or the old self that we see in scripture. Um, and it's the shame that creates that. It's the fear of our brokenness that creates it. And then we close with the promise of hope that God doesn't leave us in that mess. And we talked about how we see the mess in the first half of Genesis 3. And then on the back half, we see God stepping into the problem and kind of solving it in a sense short term by giving them actual clothes and long term through his son Jesus eventually. Um, so that's kind of just a brief recap. It was definitely a little bit of a heavier week. And I said that this series will be a little bit heavier as well. Um, and kind of challenge you guys to be a little bit more open and honest with yourselves. And if you do that, you guys will see something on the other side of it that you might not have seen if you kind of just tuned in like a normal Wednesday and then went home like a normal Wednesday. Um, and the hope of this isn't just to be like, here's a bunch of problems, go deal with it on your own time. The hope of this is like it will lead to some thoughts and some conversations with each other, with your small group leaders and people like that that love you and care about you that will help you find healing and help you become more whole on the other side of the series. Um, and if you remember, I might have shared how I shared a personal story about that for myself. Do anybody remember that? Um, I shared how I had, like, my own experience with discovering my shadow with my daughter Hadley. Um, if you remember, I said, like, there was this, like, point where I, like, realized I had this anger issue. And it was this moment where I was talking to her and then started yelling at her over, like, not sleeping. All the parents can relate to this. Um, and I said I realized afterward that it was, like, this was my shadow. This is how it was expressing itself. And I actually, like, because of my wife, because of somebody else, not myself, realized after the fact that my shadow actually presented itself when I was telling you guys that story. I didn't realize this until it was pointed out to me, and I'm bringing this up to like basically say, like, I'm sorry I misled you guys in a sense, because I actually didn't realize that in the moment. My wife actually pointed this out to me afterwards. So like after I yelled at her, I obviously like initially felt bad, but I didn't see the deeper problem until my wife was like, this is wrong. And I didn't realize I had misled you guys, so I'm sharing this for two reasons. One, to say, I'm sorry I misled you guys. It was not on purpose. Didn't realize it until it was brought to my attention afterwards. And then also to say, like, there's even parts of our shadow we don't realize are there that we can't see on our own because I did not do that on purpose and did not realize that until somebody else spoke into it. Um, so I think it's like a perfect example of how our shadow really plays out in our lives. And if we're really honest and we're really willing to listen to those people that love us, you can see it. Um, so all that to say is that I think it's like the perfect example of how we try to protect our own image and protect ourselves from that part of us that we are afraid of or ashamed of without realizing it. Um, so if you have your Bibles tonight, we're going to be in a new text tonight. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians 6. Um, but just like last week, context always matters. So we're going to talk about a little context first. Um, if you have a Bible, open that up. If you have your app, if not, we have it on the screen. It's 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 to 20. Um, we'll read it in a moment, but before that, we'll do some context. Um, so let's start pretty zoomed out. Paul, everybody's heard of that name. He's wrote most of the New Testament. Um, he became a follower of Jesus and then eventually went on to do multiple missionary journeys. And basically because of Paul, we have churches today at a very like overly simplified version of it. Because he went and carried on the mission of Jesus and went on and planted these churches, we have more churches today. The faith has moved forward because of his obedience and his mission. Um, but when he did this, what he would basically do is he would go to this city, he would talk about Jesus, say how he's following Jesus, and then he would start a church there. And then he'd move on to this next city. He would talk about Jesus, how he's following Jesus, and start a church there. And then he'd move on to this next city, and he would do it again. And he did a whole bunch. It's basically like half the New Testament is just the churches he started. And again, a very simple sense. Um, like, think about it. Like, the book of Ephesians is a letter written to the church he started in Ephesus. The book of Galatians is a letter written to the church he started in Galatia. The book of Corinthians, which we're going to read tonight, is a letter he wrote to the book, to the church of Corinth. Um, so but the thing is, though, 
we have these letters because Paul wasn't like doing what I'm doing right now and documented it and then mailed it out afterwards. This was him not abandoning those churches when he moved on. So he'd plant them, he'd go plant another church, and then he would go back and write letters to them saying like, hey, this is the true gospel, this is the true doctrine, this is whatever the issue is he was addressing. And he would write this letter to correct them, to encourage them, to exhort them, whatever his goal was with that. And he would just not abandon them. He'd walk alongside them and pastor them afterwards. Um, so the book of Corinthians, we're in 1 Corinthians. There's actually at least three letters to the Corinthians that we know about. We have two in the Bible. And some actually argue there might be a fourth letter. So we know there's three for sure because we have two, 1 and 2 Corinthians. And then in both Corinthian letters, he re references another letter that he wrote that we do not have. So we know that he wrote to them a lot, which means they had a lot of problems, right? Basically, all of his letters are like, y'all are messed up. And they have three. How messed up do you think they were, right? And then there's an argument that there's actually a fourth letter as well that he wrote to them called the Letter of Sorrows. And some argue that this letter is actually the second half of 1 Corinthians. So we're in the first half with our text today. Some argue the second half is the sorrow letter because this is where he's directly addressing their false accusations of him. So this is Paul writing to the church saying, like, what you're hearing about me is not true. And they argued this is the, either the fourth letter or the second half of the first letter. But we know for sure that Paul wrote to them three times. And we have two of them in the scriptures today. So the city of Corinth was a very interesting place, very interesting group of people. Um, like I said, a plethora of issues, division, um, infighting, things like that. One of the biggest, like, most, like, known things they were known for was actually the way they practiced sexuality. It was a super promiscuous city, like, Think of anything we do today, they did that and then worse. It was, it was bad in Corinth. Again, multiple letters correcting them. Um, and Paul, when he's writing these letters, this is what they say is some of his harsher letters. A lot of his other ones, he starts off like, greetings, like super excited for you guys, like glad to hear about your faith, whatever kind of introduction he does. And this one, he has a little bit more of a harsher tone. He's not rude where he's like, y'all suck, get it together. But he is a lot more stern. It's a lot more like a, a parent when it goes from like the first conversation to the second conversation, right? Anybody been there where your mom's like kind of nice and it's like, make sure you take out the trash. And then like next week it's like, make sure you take out the trash, right? That's basically what Paul's doing with the Corinthians. It's like, make sure you take out the trash. And now he's like, y'all need to really take the trash out. Um, but the point in saying that is like Paul's not trying to be rude. He's just getting stern with them because they keep coming back to the same problems over and over again. They keep running away from the true gospel that he preached. And he's trying to be very direct and clear with them, especially about some certain issues. And one of them, again, is that sexual immorality issue. And before you guys get, like, super uncomfortable and awkward and maybe texting your mom to pick you up early, we're not doing the sex talk tonight. Don't worry. Uh, we're doing the talk that's kind of like the driving force behind all of the sexuality issues we have in the world today. So we're not talking about sex, but what we're talking about tonight is what I believe is like the driving force behind all of it. So again, you don't need to text your mom to pick you up early. We're, we're going to get there eventually. Eventually you'll have to text your mom and say, come, home, come get me, but not tonight. Um, so our teaching text actually comes directly in the middle of his exhortation on sexuality. So on both sides of it, it's talking about sexuality. If you have a Bible, there should be a little heading at the top of the section. It talks about that directly at the top of the section as well. Um, so there's two sides of this conversation that we're having tonight as well. This is kind of part one of this conversation because, like I said, I think this is like the driving force behind all the sexual immorality issues we have in the world today. So this wouldn't fit into one talk. So this is part one tonight. Next week's going to be part two. So if you leave here and you're a little confused or have a little bit of questions, I'll gladly have a conversation and help answer them. But keep in mind, we're going to come back to this again next week as well. So if you have your Bibles open, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. Um, as we open your word tonight, Lord, and we kind of unpack what this text has to say to us today, Lord, Open our hearts to hear it. Open our minds to be open to it and just have your way, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So super random question for you guys. Who likes the zoo? Okay. Who was that was really excited? Was that you, Alex? Uh, super random question, I know. 
But anybody enjoys like looking at the like super crazy animals at the zoo that you won't see like just walking through Loxahatchee unless you get like deep in the Loxahatchee, right? Um, normally you can't get close to these animals unless you're at a place like the zoo, like lions, for example. Um, who's gone to the zoo like a lot, like more than a normal person probably? That's, I feel like you guys are all lying or you're all weird. One of the two. Um, anybody ever notice that like certain cages of the animals, you'll see the animals just pacing back and forth, like obsessively. They're just like, has anybody ever seen that? They're just doing this over and over again, particularly the lions, right? Does anybody know what that's called? Pacing? No. It's actually called zoocosis. No, it's an actual like psychological disorder that the animals develop from being in exhibits like that at the zoo. So zoocosis, zoocosis is the technical term for like when they are outside of the environment they were created for and their brain doesn't know how to process it and it is creating internal anxiety in them that's making them just pace back and forth, back and forth obsessively. So we think it's just like they're putting on a show for us, but really it's like having an internal panic attack. It's, it's funny a little bit, but it's also kind of sad, right? <laughs> I, heard a couple of, I heard a couple of chuckles. That's why I said it was funny, okay? Yell at Pam, not me. <laughs> uh, but the point in sharing this is like, this isn't the same thing as like a human having psychosis or having a psychological breakdown, but it is similar, right? The animals in the zoo that have this condition, that have zoocosis, are doing this because they're in an environment, in an exhibit that was not really created for them, right? Like it was in a sense, like that exhibit was created for lions, but it wasn't what the lion was really created for in a sense, right? Lion was created to be in the wild and roam and hunt and stalk and do all the things lions do and like have this kingdom they rule over and then we put it in a cage in a sense at a zoo in an exhibit. And I'm not like anti-zoo or anything like that. I'm setting up an idea, don't worry. And you see this happen because of this idea of psych- zoocosis. And it's really interesting because we kind of have the same experience that lions do in the world. We're living in a world that we were designed for but it has shifted and changed and broke in such a way that it's not really the world we were designed for anymore either, right? So you have these experiences where you get asked, how are you? And instead of saying like, oh, I'm doing great, I'm thriving, like some like kind of long elaborate answer talking about how good you're doing, and you say things like, I'm just trying to get to Friday, right? Just trying to get to the weekend, just waiting for summer, some of the parents just waiting for summer to be over so the kids can get back to school, right? And then there's also this experience where, like, it's almost like a survival instinct for us at this point. There's actually, I've been kind of, like, jokingly saying this as an answer, especially, like, the first week after camp when people are like, how are you? I'm like, alive and awake. Bobby's chucking a little bit because I think I've said it to you, like, three or four times in the past month. Um, there's this experience where we are in an environment that was designed for us, but it's not really the environment anymore that we were designed for. And I think the biggest issue with that is that it's like this massive lie that the enemy has taught our culture and all of us to buy into. And we don't see it this way because we're either experiencing it in a different light or we're self-medicating to the point that we don't see it. And I believe that the biggest lie that he has convinced us of that pertains to this is that we are our own. We are our own. You guys might not believe that at like surface level answer, but just like, let me play that out for a minute and yes, see if you guys connect it. So we are our own in the sense of we belong to no one else, right? We belong to ourselves. We have no accountability to anyone. We have nobody to answer to. We have no one to report to at the end of the day. Some of you guys are shaking your head yes. Some of you guys are like panic, like stop it now. Uh, we have nobody to report to for the things we do, what we say, how we treat people, what we watch what we listen to, who we date, how we date, why we're dating. We have nobody to report to, right? No, that's not how it works. And I think we all fall for this because it's kind of true. We want it to be true, but it's only half true. We want it to be true, but it's only half true. And if we're honest with ourselves, we do want it to be true. Doesn't that just sound like freedom, having the ability to do whatever you want with nobody to report to, with nobody to hold you accountable. You could do whatever you want, say whatever you want, drink whatever you want, smoke whatever you want, watch whatever you want, date whoever you want. 
I could keep going. You guys get the point. It's, this sounds like ultimate freedom to us, right? Freedom, life without restrictions. There's no limitations on us. Um, anybody watch Frozen? No right, no wrong. No right, no wrong. No rules for me. What's after that? I am free. No right, no wrong. No rules for me. I'm free. Um, the implication of this mindset is not just like, go do whatever you want. The implication of this mindset is that if we are our own and we belong to ourselves, we have no God. We are our own God. Right? If there is nobody else we're reporting to, if there's no higher power, there's no moral authority, there's nobody to report to at the end of the day, and we are our own and we belong to ourselves, we are our own God. Right? We all individually decide what is right and wrong, what is true and not true, what is good and not good. There's no one to be our judge or redeemer. We're our own judge and redeemer. Right? That's the implication of this when it plays out. It's not just, I can go do this now. It's like, no, if you're making this choice and living this way, then you are choosing to be your own God, to be your own judge, your own redeemer, your own everything. There is no higher source for purpose or meaning or significance. And because there is no higher source for purpose, meaning, or significance, there is no purpose, meaning, or significance. If everything is meaningful and purposeful and significant, then nothing is at the same time, right? There has to be something ultimate deciding what is and what is not. And this is this massive lie that our culture is bought into. Like the idea of freedom without limitations, there's nothing stopping you, there's nothing holding you back, sounds like the American dream, right? Like it sounds awesome. And I think it sounds so awesome because the best kind of lies are the ones that are half true. Like you can choose that lifestyle. It is an option, but it just doesn't work. It's easier to believe you can do whatever you want and everything will play out the way you want it to. It's easier to live into that lie. It's easier to think that you belong to yourself. It's easier to live that way. And you can accept this lie as truth and you can live into this false reality and let this play out. And at the end of the day, you're going to find yourself exhausted and empty and emotionally defeated and drained. These are the responsibilities of the self. When you choose yourself over everything else and you make yourself the ultimate authority, when you just say that you are your own, that is what you're walking into. That is the reality you're choosing to live into. And you're putting this heavy weight, this massive burden on your shoulders and for each and every one of us to be able to decide what is good and what is not. For each and every one of us to decide what is ultimately truthful. And that's just not how it works. You place a burden on yourself that you were never designed to fulfill. If we all decide what is good, again, nothing is good. And I think the real danger of this is that there's only two real responses to moments like these. And the first is that we can self-medicate. I kind of alluded to that a little bit before. We can self-medicate. And maybe you guys hear that term and you're like, I'm not doing that. When I say self-medicate, I don't mean like literally medicate. I mean use some kind of tool to cope with reality. It's something we all already do to some extent or another, some in healthy ways, some in unhealthy ways. We all do it. And self-medicating is just simply using a tool to cope with the responsibilities of the self. Like the responsibilities of choosing you are your own, choosing your own lifestyle, living this life of freedom without restrictions, meaning you could do whatever you want, right? We all self-medicate with things like Netflix and sports and video games and social media and work, things that sound harmless, right? That's like the smaller extent of it, but we do it. And then the other side of it is we self-medicate with things like drugs and alcohol and partying and like serial dating and things like that. Like we just do whatever we want. And the side, the real thing of that is that it's, you're self-medicating, you're coping, you're hiding behind these actions as a way to try to protect yourself from reality. And this is a really dangerous path to go down. Not just for the obvious like fruit of that lifestyle where it's like you could get addicted, this can happen, X, Y, and Z, and just play it out. But for the other side of it of like when you're using these coping tools, you desensitize yourself to reality. You think that that is reality. The way you are feeling when you are self-medicating is reality. And you're just burying it and burying it and burying it. 
and it actually like, kind of feeds your shadow side. So we talked about the shadow a lot last week. That was the whole point of last week. When you are self-medicating and coping and hiding, you're just feeding that and making it more strong and more powerful and making it more of your primary reality that you're living into. And then the other side of it is like at a certain point, the lines get blurred and you don't know when you're self-medicating anymore because of the pressures of life or because of who you are. Uh, one author, Alan Noble, said it like this. Do we take antidepressants because of our true self or to cope with our failure to be our true self? Do we take antidepressants because of our true self, meaning because we are depressed, or do we take it because of our failure to truly be our true self? Do we play Xbox to stay, escape from the pressure of reality and hide, or because of our failure to truly live the way God designed reality? Do we binge the latest Netflix show as a way to escape from a long day at school or work? Or do we do it because of our failure to live into the world the way God wanted us to? Do we do these things because it is reality or because we're trying to escape reality? Are we self-medicating or are we hiding or kind of both? Like if the lines get blurred, the more you do it. It just doesn't work. It just exaggerates and aggravates the situation and the problem. And our other option is that we can accept that we are not our own, but we belong to Jesus. We can accept that we are not our own, but we belong to Jesus. That is the other side of the equation. That is the other option. This is the option that takes the problems and the weight of the self and of all of the things that we just talked about. Like every problem and weight and responsibility we talked about, all of that comes off when we just say that we are not our own and we belong to Jesus. And all of this, again, comes from a place of putting a weight on yourself you were never meant to fulfill. We're putting on the responsibilities and the weights and the, like everything that Jesus is supposed to carry on our own shoulders. And again, trying to be our own God. We're taking up the responsibilities of the self that we were never meant to take up. And now maybe you hear this and you think like at best I'm exaggerating and at worst I'm just an extremist with this idea. But the reality is it's just not how life works. We are not our own. Anybody, anybody work in the room? Do you claim your own taxes? Nope, your parents do. You are not your own by the government's perspective either. So at the end of the day, it's just not how life really works. We are not our own. We belong to Jesus. And something we don't realize is that whichever way we go with this decision, the way life works is what you put in, you get back out. Right? Like the school system calls this cause and effect. The new age, like spirituality movement, calls this karma. Bible calls this sowing and reaping. Whatever you put in, you get back out. But the thing that we really don't realize with that is it's an exponential return. Like think about it with gardening. If you plant a seed for like a flower or an orange tree in your backyard, you're not going to get a single flower or a single orange. You can get a bush of flowers or an orange tree, right? The same thing plays out with this decision. If you choose to be your own, everything we talked about, all of the weight and the problems and the pressures and the tensions that we have to manage of being our own God in the sense of being our own is a heavier weight than what we were meant to carry and the return on that's gonna be way more. You're gonna feel that a lot more than what you put into it. And then the flip side, if we say that we are not our own and we belong to Jesus, what we put into that is gonna have an even bigger exponential return than what we get out of it. It's going to be a leaps and bounds difference. You, one, you'll reap a life of overwhelming anxiety and exhaustion and emptiness. And one, you'll leap, reap a life of faith, love, and joy that you cannot explain. And as we head back into worship in a moment to close out service, um, I just wanted to give you guys a moment to just pause and sit and think about that for a moment. So if everybody could close their eyes, we're all just going to take a deep breath. <sighs> deep breath across the room, and just sit with that idea, sit with that decision. You do have a choice to make. You could say, I am my own, or you could say, I am not my own. I belong to Jesus. So as Miranda is going to lead us into worship in a moment, just sit with yourself in the quiet of your heart for the next minute or two, and just reflect on that. Reflect on how you may have decided one way or the other already.
and just ask the Holy Spirit to help you release that and repent of that.